Hey there students, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the temperance movement, or as I call it, the origins of America's alcohol problem. The United States is a bit different. This is a world map of countries with the drinking age of 21. We see here the United States and a few predominantly Muslim countries in Asia. And then if you want to include Alaska, but then again, that's part of the United States, isn't it? There is nowhere else in the Western Hemisphere with a drinking age of 21. And why is that? You know, why is it that the U.S. has such a peculiar attitude toward alcohol? And when we look at the drinking age around the world, now this may be a little bit off, things change here and there, but as far as what I can compile, we have these countries with drinking ages of 16, several here, mostly in Europe. We see Cyprus and Malta at 17. 18, it's going to take a little while, okay, because after all, at 18, someone is a legal adult. And a lot of countries here, now we see China, which is, I guess, technically a communist country, an authoritarian country. I uh, saw Guatemala and Egypt, um, Hong Kong, where, of course, you know, I guess they've got a lot of freedom over there. But, you know, we are not anywhere near done. And we see all of these countries here that in most other countries, North Korea, for example, not the freest country in the world. But in most countries, being an adult is synonymous with being able to buy alcohol. And whoa, we're still not done. So why is it? Those are some Zs. I think we're finally done. But why is it that in the United States that doesn't happen? We've got a few, uh, South Korea and Nicaragua. It looks like you can drink earlier in, in North Korea than South Korea. That's curious, isn't it? And then finally, a few with a drinking age of 20. And then finally, there is the United States, along with Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Oman, Pakistan, um, Palau, and Sri Lanka. Lanka. Not very many countries have this drinking age. Now, so when we look at this map, why is it that the United States has more in common with these Asiatic countries than with other countries in the Western Hemisphere? And that is because of the temperance movement. The temperance movement, now it's kind of deceiving because temperance means moderation, but really the temperance movement, as it was understood in the antebellum period, meant abstinence from alcohol. So the branding was a bit curious here, but temperance means outright abstinence because alcohol is bad. It causes people to do bad things. People should stay away from it entirely. And so here we see here lieth a temperance man. A noted temperance man lies here. The green turf o'er his head. No man e'er saw him on his beer till after he was dead. Ha 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 ha. Get it? Now, if you don't get it, it's because you don't have that big of a vocabulary, or maybe this word's archaic. A funeral beer is something that somebody would lie on. So get it? Nobody saw him on his beer till he was dead. Ha ha ha. Knee slapper on that one. And so, you know, let's look at some temperance propaganda from the antebellum period. And what we see here is this whole slippery slope argument. Uh, the direct road to poverty, wretchedness, and ruin. This is the drunkard's progress. Now, it all starts started with the morning dram. Okay, the guy, I mean, there's a little bit of a problem there, isn't it? The guy needs to take a drink in the morning, I guess, presumably, before he goes to work. So at eight o'clock in the morning, the little children are like, whoa, what's going on there? And of course, uh, you know, mom's just kind of like side face palming or something like that. Maybe an attempted shelf. I don't know. But this is just the beginning. Okay, you see a guy taking a drink in the morning, bad things are about to happen. Then he goes to the grog shop where he's keeping bad company. He's around profound and cursing and swearing, quarreling and fighting, gambling, obscenity, ridicule and hatred of religion. The gate of hell. That's where he is, but he's not done. Let's see where we're going. We've got the confirmed drunkard. All right, so beastly intoxication, loss of character, loss of natural affection, family suffering, brutality, misery, disease, mortgages, sheriffs, writs etc. And so what we see here is now the woman is crying. Those kids are way too close to the fire. Somebody supervise your kids. You know, that's the type of supervision that killed Harambe. And then there is the father who has got the fire tongs. And instead of getting his kids out of the way, it's like, oh, you know, I'm too drunk. I can't even figure out who to hit with these fire tongs. That's what alcohol does to you, ladies and gentlemen. And the concluding scene, of course, is that, uh, that poverty, wretched, a curse and burden upon society, want, beggary, pauperism, and 
death. And so we see here where we see a Bible quote, the drunkard shall come to poverty. That's from Proverbs. And the wages of sin is death. Let's just throw that in there. Okay, that's sinful alcohol drinking. You're going to die. By the way, shout out to my friend Dev Patel in Chicago at Hinsdale Central High School, in case I forgot earlier, which I did, which is why I'm going to put the shout out now. So again, the drunkard's progress, you know, he's going up the steps here, a glass with a friend, it all started so innocently, then a glass to keep the cold out makes you warm, a glass too much, okay, got a little bit uh, tipsy there, then we're drunk and riotous, then step five, we think, oh, I'm having such a good time, step six, poverty and disease, forsaken by friends, desperation and crime, <laughs> death by suicide. And then there are your wife and child crying, but then again, why is your wife crying? She's probably better off without you because you were a no good drunk. And this is the type of propaganda people were seeing over and over again. And this led to some laws being passed, especially in the Northeast. In Massachusetts in 1838, they passed the 15 Gallon Act, which said that uh, saloons could only have 15 gallons of alcohol on the premises. And the goal was to shut down bars. Now, of course, there's a little bit of elitism here because the rich people could afford to buy alcohol in bulk. So the people who were going to drink at the garage shops, the saloons, the bars. They are the poor. And so they made it in, you know, they didn't ban alcohol entirely, but tried to limit the amount of alcohol at the places where poor people go to drink. And so we see an example here of Whig elitism, which is we've got to do something to try to keep the common person from sinning too much, from getting out of hand, because they weren't so into this whole democracy thing and faith in the common man. So remember that the Whig party is really holding on to some of these older aristocratic ideals. Now, of course, the Whig party was not afraid to embrace um, alcohol when it seemed like it sold. In 1840, Tippy Canoe and Tyler II, the so-called log cabin and hard cider campaign. Now, during this campaign, the Whigs saw, okay, you know what, we got a war hero, and we're going to say, hey, this guy is, uh, you know, he's got the hard cider, and if that can get us elected to office. Now, remember, if you've taken AP government, or you will, that the point of a political party is to elect candidates to office, and any political party is willing to compromise its so-called principles, which exist in the first place to get elected, if they're going to get candidates elected. Let's take a look at some temperance in print. Ten Nights in a Bar Room was a novel by T.S. Arthur. Now, it all started innocently enough where a guy just purchased a bar, purchased a saloon, and was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to make some money here. It was like a hotel, saloon, all of that kind of stuff. And by the end of it, either his son killed him or he killed his son. I mean, it was really, really nasty, okay? So the lesson here is if you purchase a saloon, then either you're going to kill your son or your son's going to kill you. Maybe I won't spoil the suspense in case you want to read it. And then temperance in the schools. You know, Socrates uh, said that um, his accusers were very wise because they realized that he was corrupting the youth. And if you want to get something across, give it to the youth. And so at this time, temperance societies would provide readers to these public schools. Now, remember in the North, public schools are becoming a thing with Horace Mann and the Massachusetts State Board of Education that's being organized that we see in the North organized public schools, and these public schools needed books. Well, here comes the local temperance society to the rescue. We see here a temperance reader, chapter one. Let's take a look here. Drunkenness is a vice which is remarkably ensnaring and deceitful. Imagine a kid learning to read here. Remarkably ensnaring and de key it full. Uh, you know, they're learning how to read with this. The frequent witnessing of any sin has a direct tendency to weaken our impression of its criminality. No habit is more difficult to break off than the habit of intemperance. Every intemperate man in the world was, at one period of his life, a moderate drinker. Now, here is the rationale that the temperance lobby was using in the sense that, you know, there are plenty of people who are moderate drinkers that never turn into drunks, but every drunk was at one point a moderate drinker. So when you see here, it is always better to prevent evils than to cure them. It is much better to never drink any alcohol than to have to recover from being a no good, filthy drunk.
You see what happens, Larry? This is what happens when you drink alcohol. That is the message of temperance. Temperance didn't bear fruit immediately in the antebellum period, but it did bear fruit in the 1920s. So it picked up steam and finally during the progressive era. So the temperance movement really kind of interlocked with the moralizing of the progressive era that government could be an instrument for moral improvement. And so prohibition passed. And in the 1920s, we see the government trying very hard to enforce this. The only amendment, the 18th Amendment that passed to the Constitution, the only amendment to be rescinded by another amendment, the 21st Amendment. So remember, 18, you can't drink, at least not in the United States. 21, you can drink. So the 18th Amendment, the 21st Amendment. So that's how you will remember these two amendments. It was very convenient them to do that for us. That was very nice to teachers when they thought about how to number these amendments. I know they didn't do it on purpose, but still. And so, if you wonder, why is it that the United States has a legal drinking age of 21 and nobody else seems to? It's because of the temperance movement. And it's one of those things that makes the United States a bit different from other countries in the Western Hemisphere. I hope you enjoyed that. And remember, there's more where that came from. Remember to subscribe, check out my website, and check me out on social media. It's always a pleasure.